But there are also some other questions, sorry, some other answers that sort of on the surface of it sound better, but really aren't. Things like, don't worry about that, just love Jesus. Or, that's just a side issue. It's the gospel that's important. Oh, am I still here? <laughs> well, there's no question that the gospel is important and that we should love Jesus. But the gospel, actually, has its foundation in Genesis. Here's how Jesus put the gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So, where's the connection to Genesis? Well, pretty much right there. And also here. Paul elaborates. <laughs> Paul elaborates on this in Corinthians, where he says, For since by a man came death, that's the perish part, by a man came also resurrection from the dead, the eternal life. For as in Adam, that's the man through whom came death, all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. And in Romans he puts it this way, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, so death spread to all men. So, the story of creation, after six days, God has finished all his creative work, and we have all of the animals, including humans, living in the Garden of Eden, in peace and harmony, and incidentally, all eating vegetables. But this, and God pronounced this to be very good, but this is contrary to what the evolutionary world view presents. From evolution, man doesn't appear until after millions of years of death and suffering, as recorded in the fossil record. Because the fossil record not only shows death, it shows things like bone cancer and, and fights and that sort of stuff. So there's a lot of pain and disease and death and suffering going on in the fossil record. So what are the implications for the gospel? Well, here's another way to put the gospel. Christ died for our sins, which we do because of a sinful nature inherited from Adam. But Christ's resurrection conquered death, which was introduced into the world when Adam sinned. Christ's death and resurrection provide us with the gift of eternal life which we had before Adam's sin. But you'll notice, if there's no Adam, this makes no sense. And in fact, the atheists understand this very well. Here's what one of them had to say. <clears throat> Christianity has fought, still fights, and will continue to fight science. Now I want to stop there, stop reading, because you'll notice how he's framed the issue. Christianity is fighting science. But in fact, Christianity does not fight science. In fact, many of the pillars of modern science were creationists, guys like uh, Sir Isaac Newton, James Clerk Maxwell. Many of them, uh, Isaac Newton's works, Prinker Mathematica, is full of creationist talk, religious talk, if you like, as much as it is of mathematics. So this is a false dichotomy that is put up in order to swing or control the argument. But reading on, to the desperate end over evolution, because evolution destroys utterly and finally the very reason Jesus' earthly life was supposed to be made necessary. Destroy Adam and Eve and the original sin, and in the rubble you will find the sorry remains of the Son of God. If Jesus was not the Redeemer who died for our sins, and this is what evolution means, then Christianity is nothing. So, back to Dan Brown's question. I read a book. We don't know what book. It could have been some, uh, the National Geographic, it could have been Scientific America, and it could have been almost any book you pick off a university uh, library shelf these days, or maybe these days it would be watching uh, a PBS or a Discovery Channel show. About astronomy and cosmology. <clears throat> Said the world, the universe happened by chance in an instant 14 billion years ago. But here, in the Bible, <clears throat> it says the universe was created by God over six days, about 6,000 years ago. Now Dan asked the question from the point of view of astronomy, or cosmology. But somebody else could ask a similar question about geology, from geology. 
where secular evolutionist view is that all of the geological features on the earth are a result of slow and gradual uh, deposition and erosion locally over billions of years. Whereas the Bible tells us that the geological features of the earth are a result of a catastrophic global flood that happened about 4,000 years ago. <clears throat> or somebody can ask it from the point of view of paleontology where they might say, the fossil record shows us that life started by accident in some primordial suit, and we all share a common ancestor that's evolved over billions of years. Whereas the Bible tells us that all of life was created by God, each after its own kind, about 6,000 years ago. Or they might ask it with respect to biology or genetics, where the question would be, genetics uh, shows us that man and ape have had a common ancestor about three and a half million years ago. Whereas the Bible says, mankind was created in the image of God about 6,000 years ago. So it answers the question, which is right. Now my question is, and you answer these questions. Right? Moms and dads that are here. <clears throat> Their kids are in the secular school system, the public school system. If they haven't already asked you these questions, I would expect they will sometime pretty simple. Well, can you answer them? Grandmas and grandpas, they might not come to you immediately, but maybe after they've got a question from mom and dad, they'll want a second opinion just to make sure mom and dad know what they're talking about. So can you answer these questions? Or aunts and uncles, you know, maybe these kids are really hard to convince and they want a third opinion, so they're going to come to aunts and uncles and ask you. Or maybe even big brothers and sisters. I had a, a brother who I still do, who is nine years older than I am. And when I was young, I thought he knew everything. I've since realized that wasn't the case. But when I was young, I believe anything he told. And even if you're a student in school, you can get a question about this. Or if you're at work, one of your colleagues might ask you a question. So can you answer the question? The organization for which I'm speaking tonight, Creation Ministries International, is dedicated to providing folks with information so that they can indeed answer these questions, rationally and sensibly. And there are several ways they do this. One is through a website. Everybody's got a website nowadays, right? This is an exceptional website, in my humble opinion. It gives you access to over 7,500 articles specifically written from the mostly scientific perspective of the creation versus evolution argument. Now, it's a little complicated address, so you need to pay close attention to what's coming up next, because that's the address. Okay, got that? Dial that up, <clears throat> and you'll get that, this web page that has a new featured article every day, six days a week. And it's generally something that's very current. Sometimes what they have is a uh, to and fro response from somebody who's sent in an email, uh, taking exception to something that was said, so they provide a response, and then often there's a response to that and a response to that. So there's a lot of really good dialogue going on and a lot of really good information. If you go to this tab, you get a little pop-down menu, and if you go to the very first one, Creation Topics, Questions and Answers, you'll get something like this, which lists, in alphabetical order, a large number of main headings of different topics. Now, that's not all of them either, because it's cut off at the bottom. A second, then you can go there, and that'll give you a hyperlink into a more detailed list of your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. None of this checking your brains at the church door, right? You've got to use your mind. You have to think about these things and you have to understand all of it. It has to be reasonable. It says in 1 Peter, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. And the Greek word there that is translated the reason has a kind of legal connotation. So it's a well thought of, well reasoned, logical argument. Not a nice voice to a it also needs to recognize the authority of Scripture. Okay? Second Timothy says, All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, and for correction. 
It doesn't say all scripture except the first 11 chapters of Genesis. It's all scripture. Then we also need to recognize the fact of the secular position in the kind of manner that Paul did. When Paul was talking about Jesus to the Jews, they share a common heritage and a common language. And, and so he could use words, and the Jews would understand the meaning of those words, you know, the kind of the Jewish meaning of those words. What he was talking to the Greeks, he didn't share that same common heritage. So he couldn't use those words and elicit the same response. He had to talk to the Greeks in their language and in their context. And we need to do the same. We need to recognize the fact of the secular position, which is that of evolution. Okay, back to the question, which is right. <clears throat> well, what did the data say? Now the first thing to realize is data don't actually say anything on their own. Right? Here's some data. Is it speaking to anyone? Is it saying anything? Yeah, you know, just a bunch of numbers, right? We need to have an interpretive framework to understand what data means. And here's the interpretive framework for this one. It's actually the result of a three-country study, uh, survey, I guess would be better than study, done by a, an organization called Vision Critical, which is the new name for the Angus Reid polling organization, which surveyed people's opinions about this topic, you know, were we created, did we evolve? And this is the Canadian result. Okay? Now that we know the uh, interpretive framework, we can learn some very interesting things from this data. These data. Sorry. These two numbers, for example, tell us that women are much wiser than men. <laughs> These three numbers tell us that older people are wiser than younger people. Right? And if there was a column specifically dedicated to older women, it would undoubtedly show that they are the wisest of them all. Which, of course, I already know because my wife is three years older than I am. But another interesting number is this one. 68% in the ages of 18 to 34 believe we evolved from uh, less advanced life forms. That's the same number as people, youth, who leave the church and never come back. So there would seem to be a strong correlation between those two. So the first thing we need to understand then is that data don't speak for themselves. They have, they have to be interpreted. And there are lots of examples of this besides the one I've given. There's a courtroom. Right? watch enough TV uh, police procedurals and you get familiar with what goes on in the courtroom. One set of evidence, two interpretive frameworks. One by the prosecution that says the defendant is guilty. One by the defense that says the defendant is innocent. Same evidence, same data, two interpretive interpretations. And it goes back a long way, at least all the way to Galileo, where the entire scientific establishment of his day interpreted the astronomical uh, observations to show that the Earth was at the center of the solar system. But Galileo had a different interpretation. He, his interpretation was that the Sun was at the center of the solar system. And the Aristotelians, who believed that the Earth was at the center, went to great lengths to construct elaborate theories of spheres within spheres that would explain all of these strange observations. So they had their own interpretive framework. And of course, anyone who's taken a science lab will recognize this, right? Conclusions in the science lab are an interpretation of the observations in the framework of the hypothesis. Next thing we need to understand is the difference between operational science and origin science, or historical science, or forensic science, whatever you want to watch, call it. Operational science is a study of how things operate today. How does F equals MA, force of gravity, it's observable, and you can run experiments over and over and over again to demonstrate what it is. Origin science, on the other hand, is the study, if you want to call it that, of how things came to be. It's not observable, other than the fact that the thing that came to be is, 
You didn't observe how it happened, it's just Peter. It's not subject to repeatable experimentation. So it is, in effect, speculative. Let me give you an example. Consider the 747. Operational science tells us how it flies. And it's relatively straightforward, right? Get the right balance between all of those forces and then it'll go up or down or stay where it is. But knowing that actually tells us nothing about how the 747 came to be. In fact, it came to be through an entirely different set of science and processes than what makes it fly. So the two aren't related at all. So let's consider how the 747 might come to be. Now there's a famous mathematician, I'm sure you all know him, household name, right? Everybody knows at least one famous mathematician. His name is Sir Fred Hoyle. Must have been famous, he's called Sir. He once said that the probability of life occurring by chance is about the same as the probability that a tornado would go through a junkyard and leave a 747 in its wake. Now, people would have us believe that life did indeed happen by chance, so maybe we should consider this is one of the possible ways that a 747 could be formed. But if that's a bit of a stretch, right, maybe we should do it incrementally. So we'll have one tornado go through the junkyard and leave the undercarriage, and then after a while, you know, maybe millions of years, have another tornado come through and add a wing and an engine. I think you can see where this is going. All right, and some more of these go through, and eventually we have a 747. So we now have two options for how the 747 came to be. But hold it, there's a third one. Some intelligent agents, let me call them engineers. I used to be an engineer, so I like to think that maybe they were intelligent. Does some design work and creates a specification for the airplane. And some more intelligent agents do some more design work and create a set of processes by which the airplane described in that specification can be built. Not done yet. Some more intelligent agents take the specification for the airplane the processes that have been designed, and design a factory in which you can implement those processes in order to build the airplane. But we're not done yet. We have some more intelligent agents that go into the factory and implement the processes to build the airplane. So we now have another way to build the airplane. However, if somebody says, a priori, on philosophical grounds only, I'm not going to allow the consideration of any intelligent agents. Then this becomes unusable. That's no longer a valid way for the 747 to have been built. And we have to choose from one of the others. So from the point of view of 747 origins, if you look at the 747 through a lens without a filter on it, in particular, it allows for the use of intelligent agents, then you would come to the logical conclusion that the uh, 747 was actually designed. And we all know it was. But if you say, no, I don't allow intelligent agents, then you're limited to saying it happened by accident. So you built a filter into your lens of how you're interpreting the data. Your interpretive framework is excluding possibilities. And it's the same with life, right? We look at the evidence. Everyone has the same evidence, right? Showing examples of the evidence here. If you look at it through a lens that allows all possibilities, you come to the conclusion that it's been created. If you filter out some of the possibilities on a philosophical ground, which is basically what is done, then you come to the conclusion of evolution. Now one of the things that is fundamental to uh, evolution, even standing a chance of being successful, and there are many, many, many things that argue against it, but one of the fundamental issues is the matter of time. Um, it, you know, the mantra sort of is that even though something is highly improbable, given enough time, it'll happen. So time is very important to the argument for evolution. 
And the original argument, the original issue of time, originally there was no question about this, but uh, in the late 1600s, early 1700s, a couple of guys brought forward the idea of uniformitarianism, which is basically that all of the geological processes that we see going on today have always gone on at the same rate at which they go on today. So the rate at which sediment is laid down, the sedimentation rate, has always been the same. So what they do then is they look at these thick layers of rock that are in the Grand Canyon, and they say, okay, at today's sedimentation rate, it would have taken millions of years for those to have been laid down. And then they look at today's erosion rates, and they say, it would also have taken millions more years for the Colorado, for the Grand Canyon to have been eroded away. And that's leaving out the millions of years that it might take for the rock to actually become rock. Right? So, are these valid assumptions? They are assumptions, because we don't know what the rates were in the past. Is that the only way that rocks can be laid down and formed? And do they take a long time to become rock? Well, in the 1980s, Mount St. Helens erupted. And the resounding answer was no. Here's a picture of some rock beds. There are actually three separate layers of rocks in the upper right-hand picture. One at the bottom is an ash layer, which was from the ash fallout of the volcano, which was laid down over a few days. The next layer, which is shown in uh, larger in the bottom thing, has all the same layering that you see in the rocks in the Grand Canyon. And that layer, you can see how thick it is relative to the person down below, that layer of rock was laid down in two hours of, by a very high velocity, highly sediment loaded flow of water that erupted out of the place where it had been uh, contained. Right? So it doesn't take a long time to lay down the blocks like the blocks you see in the Grand Canyon. All you need is a huge volume of water that's full of sediment and flowing very quickly. What does that sound like? Okay, how long does it take rocks to form? Well, here's a rock that was found on a beach, and you can see that it looks different than the other rocks. Well, the folks that noticed it noticed that, so they bent down, picked it up, and they turned it over and found a toy car. Okay, well, toy cars haven't been around for millions of years, so this rock obviously didn't take millions of years to form, so rocks really don't. Here's another rock that I think we're all familiar with, here it is being laid down, and it can be laid down pretty quickly. And it comes in different thicknesses. Here's one fairly thin thickness. It shouldn't take too many years to lay down. Here's a quite a bit thicker formation, which must have surely taken millions of years because it's so thick. And I, you probably all recognize this one too. That must have taken a really long time to lay down because it's so thick. I mean, applying uniformitarian principles. And there's another one. <coughs> but of course, this rock is concrete, and it reaches its maximum hardness in 28 days. Or if you get the kind that you put around posts, 28 minutes. So it doesn't take rock a long time to become hard rock. It just takes the right conditions, water, cementing agent, and an aggregate. Well, how about the erosion side of it? The usual story is the Grand Canyon, Colorado River along the bottom of the Grand Canyon. Look at this tiny little river. It took millions of years to erode the Grand Canyon. Now, once again, Mount St. Helens destroyed that myth. Here's a picture of a canyon that's called, actually called the Little Grand Canyon because topologically it looks just like the Big Grand Canyon, only it's 1 40th the scale. And that canyon was carved through this rock in a couple of hours by, again, a huge outflow of lake, of water that had been dammed up as a result of Mount St. Helens eruption and eventually burst through its dam, it just flowed down its channel. Carved up this, I think it's 100 meters deep. And then there's this one, which is the engineer, called the engineer's canyon, because the engineers caused it when they decided they had to drain Spirit Lake, which had been dammed up again by uh, Mount St. Helens eruption, and they pumped the water out of Spirit Lake, and this canyon was formed in about 28 months. Now, in both cases, you can see a small river running along the bottom of it. So if you were to come across this with the uniformitarian mindset after the fact and didn't know how it was formed, you would say it must have taken millions of years for that little river 
to erode that canyon. And yet that's not the case in either of those cases. So maybe it's not the case in the case of the Grand Canyon either. But would there have been enough water to do all of this? You know, the Bible talks about a global flood covering the entire world, from all the high mountains. Well, if you look at the world from the right perspective, as in this uh, picture, where's the land? Right? It's all water. And in fact, 70% of the Earth's surface is covered with water. And the depths are such, in some of the places, very, very deep trenches, that if you were to make the Earth into kind of like a smooth ball, there'd be a layer 2.7 kilometers deep all over the Earth. So the Bible tells us the water for the flood covered all the high mountains and then some. So how high are mountains? Well, some of you may have been to this mountain. I actually lived at the foot of this mountain for five years while I went to McMaster to get my PhD. It's called a mountain. But the top of it is only 220 meters above sea level, well below the 2.7 kilometers. And here's another Hamilton mountain. It's in the U.S., so it's bigger than our Hamilton mountain. But it's still only 700 meters above sea level at the top. So I used to live in Calgary until last November. So I thought, well, how about some things that are really on in the mountains? Like Ben Springs Hotel, or Shadow Lake Louise, or the Columbia Bicefields, or Jasper. And those are their elevations above sea level. How about the place where we held the Winter Olympics? Must be really high, right? Because it's got snow and Winter Olympics and so on. It's only 670 meters above sea level. So even without crunching down the mountains at all, a 2.7 kilometer thick layer of water would cover all of these things. Yes. Now, clearly, Mount Everest doesn't fit. It's 8.8 kilometers high. But if you look at Mount Everest, Really closely, you can see it's made up of sedimentary rock. That is rock that was laid down underwater. So it was underwater at one time. Well, but how about fossils? Fossils take a long time, right? Well, here's the standard uh, explanation of how fossils are formed. Animal dies. Well, and look where it's dying, incidentally. In the water. Well, why would it be doing that? Well, maybe because that's all there was. Water, water everywhere. Anyway, dies in the water, sinks to the bottom, lies there very nicely. Flesh disappears, and you've got this nice layer of bones, nice set of bones, and then gradually over millions of years, the sediment comes in and covers the bones, and then more millions of years, the rocks are lifted up out of the water and eroded away. There's several problems with this. The very first one is that when things die in the water, they don't sink. They float. That's why in the mobster movies they always give them concrete overshoes, right? Because they float. And they do. So what happens when they float? Well, flesh decomposes and the bones fall all over the bottom and not in one nice little place, so they're all together. <clears throat> so the only way you can get these nicely preserved entire skeletons is something like this happens. You get a huge turbidity current under the water that's moving lots of sediment along, like might have happened after, say, the earthquake off Japan and created that big tsunami and lots of mud moving across the ocean floor, covering up these poor little fish. So there he is, all covered up, nicely protected uh, in an <coughs> anaerobic environment so that the flesh dissolves nice and carefully and we're left with some bones that eventually get mineralized and turned into fossils. And that this hap is what happens is clearly illustrated by this, which is the fossil of an ichthyosaur giving birth. Now one would hope this birth process doesn't take millions of years. So that was obviously done very quickly. Or this, another fish fossilized or covered while having lunch. And it surely wouldn't take them a million years to swallow another fish. So these two were obviously buried very quickly. But maybe it takes a long time for them once they're buried to turn into fossils. Not so. Here's a fossilized hat. And that's obviously not been around for millions of years, so it didn't take millions of years to fossilize. And here's a fossilized bag of flour. Now, you can see here, I annotated this with references to Creation Magazine. This is another information source that you can use to help you answer your questions. 
Here's the cover of one of the issues of Creation Magazine. It's issued by Creation Ministries International four times a year. It contains all kinds of interesting articles, all of them relatively short. For example, here's one that talks about how long it takes to form rock. And it reports on some PhD uh, research, thesis research that was done at a university in Western Australia where they used bacteria to transform sand, first into sandstone, which is a relatively soft stone, but then by repeating the process, turned it into rock-hard marble in just a few weeks. So again, it doesn't take rocks a long time to become rocks. And this, in fact, uh, the uh, people from the Netherlands are quite interested in this because they've got a lot of sandy dikes that they would very much like to turn into marble. That would be really good for them. This is what it says. From soft sand to marble hard rock. Quickly. And here's an article uh, about a new dinosaur find that's been named Dracorex, a dinosaur that looks like a dragon. And we'll talk about him a bit in the next one. There's always a section for kids, all written specifically to explain this issue to children, and generally also a very thought-provoking article like this one, which is written by Calvin Smith, who is in the Canadian office, and he wrote about a college uh, evangelist who, as Calvin said, probably uh, shares his faith more times in a day than most of us would in a year or maybe even a lifetime. And this is what the evangelist said. My time on college campuses and talking to high schoolers, the number one answer that I get for they're not being a God, so then I don't have to believe in the gospel is evolution. Now if I could have my clipboard helpers again, we're now going to circulate the clipboards and uh, with this form on it if you'd like to uh, get a subscription to uh, Creation Magazine, if you can give us your uh, name and mailing information on the left hand side, and then, now this is very important, doesn't it prove that the world is real? I mean, this is like nuclear physics stuff, right? It's really science. <clears throat> well, this is how carbon-14 is produced. Right? You get cosmic rays coming into the atmosphere and they get nitrogen atmosphere and they turn it, or nitrogen and they turn it into carbon-14. Now, carbon-14 is unstable. It's radioactive carbon. But it works uh, chemically just like regular carbon. So it forms carbon dioxide. The plants use carbon dioxide with carbon-14 in it for photosynthesis, and the animals eat the, carbon dioxide, or eat the plants, and we eat the animals. So we all have this nasty stuff in our bodies. Right? How does that make you feel? Well, full of radioactive carbon-14 right now. Yeah, good stuff, eh? When the plant or the animal dies, they stop ingesting carbon, and so Carbon-14 starts decaying away. So while we're still alive, the ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12 is the same in our bodies as it is in the atmosphere. But once we die, it starts to change. And here's what happens. The carbon-14 really wants to be nitrogen, so it goes back to nitrogen. Then the carbon-14 that's in the dead thing, whatever it is, starts to decay. Now radioactive things decay in a peculiar way. They decay over a time interval that's called a half-life. And that's the time during which half of the radioactive material turns to the non-radioactive material, like this. So half of the carbon-14 at the start turns to nitrogen-14, and we're left with half of the original stuff. And then the next half-life, half of the remaining carbon-14 changes to nitrogen, and we're left with a quarter. And that goes on and on and on and on. Now, there's not very much carbon-14 in us, compared to carbon-12, which doesn't change. So the carbon-12 changes all up, stays the same. So you can see, by measuring the ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12, we can tell how long this has been going on. There's one atom of carbon-14 for every 1.2 trillion atoms of carbon-12. That's not very much. So you're not very radioactive, it's okay. You're not going to glow in the dark when you're going. Now, but it, so it's not very much to measure, but we have some, they've developed some really sensitive measuring uh, equipment called accelerator mass spectrometers that can measure down to 0.002%, that's 0.00002 of the amount of carbon 
of the ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12 that is currently in the atmosphere. But after that, the carbon-14 becomes totally undetectable. And if you do the calculations based on the assumption that carbon-14 in the atmosphere has always been at the same ratio as it is today, back through history, then you cannot detect carbon-14 in things that are older than 90,000 years. Okay? Coal. Samples of coal were taken from a number of coal beds around the U.S. that were at different levels in the geological column that were supposedly some anywhere between 37 million and 318 million years old. They were sent off to a carbon-14 lab and they measured huge amounts of carbon-14 that were equivalent to an age of about 50,000 years. Give it, take it. Not only that, some diamonds were sent off from, that were allegedly between one and three billion years old, and they had the same amount of carbon-14 in it, more or less, about 50,000 years. So according to the carbon-14 dating, the coal and the diamonds are roughly the same age. According to the standard geological evolutionary dating scheme, they're vastly different ages. And both of them are so much older than, than 90,000 years that you shouldn't be able to see any carbon-14 at all. Hmm. Well, carbon-14 only works for organics. What about real rocks? Well, there are a number of different radioactive dating techniques that have been used on real rocks, and I've listed some of them here. The most commonly used one is this one I've circled, which is potassium to argon. And the reason it's most commonly used, one of the reasons it's most commonly used, is it's easy to do. And the other is, the general assumption is that when these metamorphic rocks, that's like lava, right? So when lava comes out, it boils off all of the argon gas, argon gas, so all of the gas, argon is expelled from the rock. So when the rock solidifies, there's no argon present, and all the argon that you see in the rock, that you measure in the rock, has come from this radioactive decay, so you can do this calculation, you get the answer. How, does, how well does this work? Well, there was a volcano in New Zealand that's got an unpronounceable name, but it has erupted three times in the last 50, 60 years. 1949, 1954, and 1975. So they took some rock samples from these lava flows and sent them off to get radiometrically dated. And these are the results. See, the rock, the lava flow in 1954 in particular had dates come back anywhere from 270,000 to 3.5 million years. And, and you'll notice that they're pretty confident in that 3.5 million year age. You know, it's somewhere between 3.3 and 3.7. But that doesn't include 0.27. So they don't agree at all. In fact, if you draw them on a graph, it looks like this. You get three results that sort of agree with each other, and then four that sort of agree with each other, but don't agree with the first three, and maybe a one that's way up there. But they're all supposedly very accurate. So, well, maybe there was something wrong with this, this particular dating scheme. And indeed, when things like this happen, what they say is, well, there must have been some argon in the rock originally, so these dates aren't reliable. So they tried a couple of other techniques, <clears throat> rubidium strontium and samarium neodymium. Things get even worse. Now we've got ages of 133 and 197 million years for this rock that's 50 years old. So they said, well, I must have contamination there too. Mm -hmm. So they tried another technique, which is supposed to eliminate all the problems with um, contamination. It's called the isochrome technique. Lead, lead, isochrome technique. And lo and behold, this rock is now four million, four billion years old. Oh dear. So maybe this radioactive dating doesn't really tell us what the age of the rock is at all. And here's another interesting um, situation that occurred in a mine in Australia <coughs> where the profile through the mine looked like this. Some sands and clays, then a basalt layer, and then some more sandstone and clay limestone with those sort of 
more or less ages is derived from the geological column. So when they got down in the mine, they found some wood, you know, tree stumps, that were bottom in the sandstone, tops in the basalt. So they set the basalt off to get radiometrically dated, and the basalt is 45 million years old. They sent the wood off to get radiometrically dated with carbon 14, and it came back as roughly the same age as the coal and the diamonds and all that other stuff at 45,000 years old. But how can you have 45,000 year old wood entombed in 45 million year old rock? Well, radiometric dating is based on a number of assumptions, none of which can be absolutely verified. So if you think of it as radioactive material running through an hourglass to become non radioactive, the assumptions are that you know what the starting amount is of both, in particular the latter. You also that you have that the rock sample has neither gained nor lost from leaching any of the um, parent or any of the daughter samples. And indeed, there's also an assumption that the decay rate has remained constant throughout time. We know decay rates can be changed by chemical and physical processes. So uh, maybe uh, it hasn't. <clears throat> but the whole kind of thrust of all of this is if you have a rock that you know is 50 years old and you're told that the age is, is 1.35 billion years old, plus or minus a tiny wee bit that doesn't include 50, and it's wrong, when somebody gives you a rock for which you don't know the age and they give you an age for that rock, how do you know it's right? I mean, every time we measure the age of a rock that we know, it's wrong. So how do you know the ones that you don't know are right? Okay, then there's the issue of soft tissue in T-Rex bones. This was really interesting. There was a T-Rex found skeleton found in Montana, and the femur, the leg bone, was so big, they couldn't put it in the helicopter in one piece to take it back to the museum. So they had to cut it in half. When they cut it in half, the lady said, the lady said it was exactly like looking at a slice of modern bone. But of course, I couldn't believe it. I said to the lab technician, the bones, after all, are 65 million years old. How did she know that? The bone didn't have a tag on it that said, I'm 65 million years old. She said it was 65 million years old because she'd been told that dinosaurs went extinct 65 million years ago. How could blood cells survive that long? Well, precisely, they can. Thermodynamics and laboratory experiments will tell you that biological tissue will decompose completely in a few thousand years. So how do these blood cells survive 65 million? Well, this would mean, if you kind of take it to its logical conclusion, that people and dinosaurs lived at the same time. Indeed, that's correct. Is there any evidence for that? Well, of course, or I wouldn't ask the question. Oops, back up. This is the Angkor Wat Temple in Cambodia. It has lots of carvings in it, all in stone, right? <laughs> Including this one which sure looks like a stegosaurus. Now, what's the big deal? Well, the temple was dedicated in 1186, and the first stegosaurus fossil was found in the mid-1800s. So in that case, how did the person who carved the stegosaurus know what it looked like? Unless he had access to some cultural history that described it to him from someone who had seen one Ah oh, yes, but the fossil record shows us evolution has happened. Right? It shows all kinds of things. Well, here's a diagram of the fossil record, which is a bit complicated, so just kind of let me highlight major points. This part is fossils of plants, going across that way. This part is fossils of animals, and this part is fossils of what they refer to as stationary marine groups, which, by which they mean sponges and corals. Dashed lines are saltwater things, solid lines are either freshwater or terrestrial things. 
And of particular interest is this line here. The section of rock immediately above it is referred to the King, it's referred to as the Cambrian layer, and the rock below it, not surprisingly, is referred to the Precambrian. And this layer, you'll notice, or this line across there, you'll notice, hardly anything below it, and there's all kinds of stuff above it. And this, in fact, is referred to as the Cambrian explosion, and is a problem for evolution. Because as one fellow, one evolutionist said, all the major phyla, that's groups of things, of life which we know today, appeared in the Cambrian with no evolutionary ancestors. And in the rock layers above the Cambrian, no new or different body plants appeared. Now what evolution would say is that we should see this, you know, very simple, simple organism that eventually developed in different directions and different complexities and became in effect the root for the tree of life from which everything branches off from this single cell thing. But there is no root. And in fact, if you look at it, it's not a tree, it's an orchard. It's a whole bunch of trees that don't interconnect. And this is exactly what you would expect to see from the biblical account of creation. God created everything after its own kind. So one of these trees might be, say, cat kind, and another one would be the dog kind, dog branches, and cat branches, but you don't have things going across. Now the other thing that this shows <clears throat> is the lack of transitional fossils, or the missing links. What you would expect to see from evolution is this kind of thing. Transitional forms linking one of the vertical rows to the other vertical row in a progressive manner across from the simple side to the more complicated side. But you don't. There are at best a handful of highly disputed transitional forms. And I don't mean highly dispute, disputed by creationists, I mean highly disputed within the evolutionary community. They don't accept that they are transitional forms. <clears throat> and the situation is so bad, if you like, that this guy, who is a very famous evolutionary biologist uh, who used to be at Harvard, Stephen J. Gould, he's now deceased, he kept trying to get his colleagues to fess up to this. He said, look, the absence of fossil evidence for intermediate stages between major transitions organic design has been a persistent and nagging problem for gradualistic <coughs> evolution. So, his solution? Switch over to biblical creation? Well, hardly. He came up with this idea that he called punctuated equilibrium, by which he meant that most of the time, everything stays the same. And then, every so often, we have a very rapid evolution. In fact, it's so rapid, there's no time for fossils. So, in other words, Proof of his theory is the absence of any evidence. Pretty good. <laughs>